Good morning, my name is Mary Ann Gary. I'm a member of the governing board here at APS. And on behalf of the association, I want to thank you for coming this morning as we honor Rob McCoon. Rob McCoon is the James and Patricia Cowell Professor of Law and a Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. McCoon has shown time and time again his remarkable skill, his flair really, for doing outstanding scientific work in the field of individual judgment and small group processes. His extraordinary work has never shied away from politically sensitive topics, illegal drug use, gays in the military, and tort law, to name just a few. He's also shown us many ways that biases can color how lay people interpret evidence and how we as scientists can interpret evidence too. In 2001, McCoon published a book with the economist Peter Reuter called Drug War Heresies, Learning from Other Vices, Times, and Places, I can tell you as of this morning, it's available for a very nice price on Amazon, hardback, paperback, and Kindle. When it first appeared, the nation called it an enormously important, indispensable book. To this day, when politicians debate if and how to legalize drugs, no matter where they are in the political spectrum, this book is among the first they turn to. McCoon's work also helped drive the Pentagon's recommendation to repeal the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy which discriminated against gay men and lesbians in the US military. For that work, he analyzed cohesiveness in military units and the distinction between how well people get along, what we call social cohesion, and how committed people are to the same mission, or what we call task cohesion. He drew on data from the UK and Canada and Israel, showing that allowing gays and lesbians to serve in the armed forces had no ill effects on military culture. When you consider it all together, it's very clear that McCoon's research on social issues cuts across levels of analysis, from basic cognitive processes to group dynamics to institutional and political systems. And we are fortunate in this association and in the scientific community to have him as a prodigious contributor to the scientific literature and as a thoughtful, effective ambassador to policymakers who want their decisions to be informed by the best possible science. On behalf of APS, I am pleased to present the 2019 James McKean Cattell Fellow, Rob McCoon. Wow. Thank you. Do you have photos? Thank you. Thank you so much. Got to make sure I don't drop this. So. Um, I want to thank APS. And there are a lot of other people I want to thank, and I could do my acknowledgments now, but in a way, my whole talk is acknowledgments, because my talk is really about working in teams and, and the value of working in teams. <clears throat> in trying to think about what to talk about today, uh, I, was, I went back to, to uh, uh, George Miller's 1969 APA presidential address, which has always inspired me for reasons I think you'll see later in the talk. He says, it's customary on this occasion to summarize one's own research, although that would be a more comfortable role. I've decided instead to express some personal opinions about the current state of our discipline and its potential role in meeting the human problems of our society. And I'm going to take the same tack. Um, I, uh, oops, that was for definitely the wrong button. Um, I will talk in passing about some of the research that was just mentioned, uh, and I'm very proud of my research, and I encourage you to, to look it up on Google and read it. But I'm gonna talk more about the process of doing policy-relevant research uh, in, in large interdisciplinary teams. Um, the topics uh, that I've chosen to work on in my career are not always public policy topics. I've done my share of two by two factorial experiments. I've done quite a few of them actually, but, um, but I've always been drawn to pu public policy issues. And in fact, the kind of issues I'm particularly drawn to, um, glutton for punishment maybe, are what you might call hot button issues. Uh, topics that are heavily politicized with strong passions. Um, where there's a role for empirical research in at least trying to sort out the empirical questions that are not the entirety of the debate, but an important part of the debate. 
Uh, in order to do this effectively, it's really been important for me to try as hard as possible to cultivate a reputation as an honest broker um, so I can get people on all sides of the debate to take uh, my work seriously. And I'll talk about that honest broker role today. Um, and really, to understand these big public policy issues, psychology is vital, but it's, it's not sufficient on its own. It's really important to tackle these issues by looking at a full range of disciplinary perspectives, psychological, cultural, economic, um, legal, and a whole host of other disciplines. So just a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to uh, start by talking a little bit about my collaborative history, because I think it's, it's not unique in APS, but it's definitely unusual. Uh, as you'll see, I, I've done a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration uh, with a lot of different disciplines. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the case for interdisciplinarity um, and also what I see as some prejudice against interdisciplinarity. Uh, and then I'm going to make some disciplinary comparisons, just idiosyncratic, unique uh, perceptions and, uh, of my own that, that um, you may or may not share if you've worked with some of these other disciplines. And I'll talk about the lessons I draw from these collaborations, uh, certainly for my own work, um, and maybe for other psychologists. And then I want to come back to an idea that is really part of that George Miller talk, the idea of giving psychology away. So I've had a quirky career path. Um, uh, I've loved it, but it's, uh, it's not a typical psychological path. So I started out fairly typically by, by doing graduate work in experimental social psychology. Bill Crano is in the audience here, was one of my professors, and Norb Kerr was my advisor. Norb Kerr, you may be familiar with, he introduced the term harking for hypothesizing after the results are known, which has turned out to be an important part of the replicability crisis, something I will also come back to. I then went to a, uh, do a postdoc in psychology and law at Northwestern with Reed Hastie and Tom Tyler. Um, and then I, my first job, for seven years, I was a behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation. And in fact, I've really had a lifelong uh, relationship with RAND. I continue to collaborate with people at RAND and consult on, on projects. In 1993, I moved to UC Berkeley, where I became a professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy. And then after a few years, uh, colleagues in the law school asked me uh, if I wanted a Detroit joint appointment and to teach their students, uh, and I said yes. And it's important I, to note that although I'm uh, now uh, a chair in law at uh, Stanford Law School, I've never actually taken a class in law. Um, so I'm kind of a professional imposter. Uh, I tell my students that first day every class, just so there's no, um, no buyer's remorse. So this is, uh, um, through the wonders of the R programming language, you can make uh, co-author networks. You feed it your CV, and with a little extra work, you can, you can produce this diagram that shows um, all your uh, co-authors. And uh, the names are too small for you to read, unfortunately, because I've had a lot of co-authors, because I work in teams. Um, but uh, a lot of the people that are in that collaborator network are, in fact, psychologists. And I love collaborating with psychologists. I've had the opportunity to collaborate with some wonderful psychologists. Um, and um, some of you may recognize some of the people here. But I've also worked with people in a lot of other disciplines. Uh, uh, I've worked with quite a few economists. And in fact, I've published quite a lot with economists um, in both uh, economic journals and, and sort of interdisciplinary um, outlets. I've also worked with sociologists and political scientists. Uh, uh, unsurprisingly, because I'm at a law school, I've had a lot of collaborators who were lawyers. Uh, a couple physicians, a couple statisticians, a historian, and historian, I guess you say, and historian. And, uh, an engineer, and a physicist. And 
The physicist uh, will appear later in the talk. This is Saul Perlmutter, uh, who received the Nobel Prize in, um, in physics for his work uh, on supernova observations, something, of course, he sought me out as a collaborator for. Uh, I've also done a lot of collaborative teaching. Um, uh, to, taught courses with uh, philosophers, a classicist, uh, lawyers, uh, Saul the physicist, uh, uh, and I, for a few years uh, at Berkeley, I taught a course with Henry Brady, who's a political scientist, another course with Bob Cooter, who's an economist. And I've really enjoyed these collaborative relationships. Uh, and they've really been vital to my, to my career. Now, a few caveats about what follows. First, I should say, the people who are willing to collaborate with me are about as unrepresentative of their disciplines as I am of mine, right? So uh, I'm not collaborating with card-carrying mainstream uh, economists and, and political scientists and the like. Um, they are also people who have a taste for interdisciplinarity. Uh, Another caveat is, I'm going to make some generalizations about psychology. And like all generalizations, there are exceptions. And I, I have no doubt you'll be able to think of exceptions to anything I say about psychology. Uh, the good news for me is there's no Q&A period, so you don't get to argue with me about it. So. <clears throat> OK, the case for interdisciplinarity. Now, you may not agree that there's a prejudice against interdisciplinarity. That might not be your perception. Maybe I'm hypersensitive about this, but I've always felt that doing applied work, doing uh, policy relevant work, and collaborating with the other is, uh, is frowned on by some people in our discipline. And uh, my, my collaborators say they encounter similar attitudes in s some of the other disciplines. Actually, not all the other disciplines, but in some of these other disciplines. And I think there are some reasons in psychology to be a little wary of interdisciplinarity. We privilege lab studies over field studies. Uh, lots of people here do field studies, but, but by and large, th our favorite tool in our toolbox, toolbox is the factorial experiment with random assignment to condition. Um, and that means a lot of us mostly work with experimental data rather than observational data. We also mostly work with our own data rather than data collected by someone else. And if you want to do policy relevant research, a lot of times you've got to be willing to use other people's data with all the problems that entails. I think there's also a reason why people privilege basic research because it's a way of protecting the autonomy of the academy from um, outsiders who want to tell universities what they should be doing. Um, and I respect that and, and I share that view to some extent. Um, but I just want to call it out uh, um, because it, I think it comes with some costs. I also think uh, some people worry about that policy research is going to be sort of ad hoc, transitory, and heavily politicized. You know, maybe the research I've done on, on uh, uh, the question of gays and lesbians in the U.S. military was valuable in its time but it, it won't have a lasting effect because the issue has, we've moved on, that, that issue has passed. Um, that's okay, I, I, that may be true, I'm okay with that, um, and, uh, but it's a, a matter of taste. Uh, so what are the advantages of interdisciplinarity? I think you've all thought about this before, so th there's no startling revelations here, but it helps bridge levels of analysis um, particularly for policy analysis, it's really crucial to consider things other than un units that are individual people. We need to think about groups and neighborhoods and markets and institutions, and also uh, things that aren't people, like laws and contracts and written artifacts that help shape policy problems. Interdisciplinarity helps reduce groupthink, I think. Um, it certainly has enlarged my toolbox. I've learned about all sorts of methodologies um, by collaborating with other people. I just think it's fun. I really enjoy collaborating with other people. And part of the fun is a lot of times I'm the only psychologist in the room, and I get away with murder. Because I can just say, well, psychology says, 
And, and there's no other psychologist to argue with me. And believe me, if there were other psychologists in the room, they would argue with me. So um, <clears throat> there are two different ways that you can think about interdisciplinarity. Um, I think the way it's mostly unfolded in my career is the, is the first picture, which is different people with different disciplinary perspectives come together and work together as a team. Um, but over time, what I find is those of us who do a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration start becoming sort of interdisciplinary all by ourselves. So now I'm increasingly likely to see the economic aspects of policy questions that I look at or the institutional issues that a political scientist would notice or the legal constraints that a lawyer would notice. And for me, that's really been valuable and I've enjoyed that. Okay, now. Here we go into some stereotyping. I'm going to make some generalizations about some of the disciplines. Um, these are my own views, and, and uh, you may have others, but uh, I have the microphone. So I had this cute idea. I was, I was going to actually try to rank the disciplines on the big five personality inventory, and it really wasn't very plausible. <laughs> um, uh, you, you could do it by thinking about, well, what are some of the dimensions that really distinguish um, disciplines, deductive versus inductive, uh, mathematical versus verbal, quantitative versus qualitative, introversion versus extroversion is the one that survived from the big five, and basic versus applied. Um, uh, one thing about deduction I want to uh, point out, when I made this slide, it occurred to me, I, had never, I, I can't remember ever making a formal deduction in my career. I, of course, I'm making deductions all the time, but by formal deduction, I mean actually working through a logical uh, syllogism um, uh, or uh, mathematical proof. And, and of course, that's the very bread and butter uh, of the work of some of my colleagues in other disciplines. There are a lot of differences in professional norms. Um, I don't, are we allowed to mention APA here? I don't know. but. Uh, uh, one of the things I'm particularly proud of is uh, APA style. If you don't like APA style, try collaborating with a lawyer uh, and, and using footnotes, and, and you'll come around real quickly to, uh, to the advantages of APA style. Um, the very decision to collaborate varies across disciplines. So there are, of course, uh, collaborations in the other social sciences and in law, but they're much less common than they are in psychology. And in fact, in faculty meetings at Stanford Law School, there's always this question of, if someone publishes with other co-authors, does it count, or how do we count it? Um, much as we're more collaborators, we have more collaborators than they do, we're completely dwarfed by physics where uh, you can find papers with dozens of co-authors. Uh, um, I've seen physics articles in which the, the first two pages of the article are just the author list. So, um, There's also a question of whether even to be an author, and it turns out disciplines differ in, in, in the question of whether um, we as professors should be a co-author when our students publish their thesis research. And, that's pretty routine. It's not universal in psychology, but it's pretty common. There are some disciplines where they recoil at that notion and, and, and uh, question that notion. Authorship order in psychology is usually done in order of uh, contribution, uh, or if it's done alphabetically or randomly, there'll be a footnote that explains that. In economics, it's almost always alphabetical because I collaborate with economists this has led to a lot of interesting conversations, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, and then there are some fields in which being the final author, the final author is called the senior author, and that's actually a coveted spot. It took me a while to, to figure this out, and I thought some colleagues were being extremely generous and offering to go last and bump me up earlier on the list until I figured this out. So, um, <clears throat> Another way in which we, dis we di differ from some of the other disciplines um, uh, is in diversity, in particular gender diversity. Um, uh, there's a lot more gender diversity in psychology than in some of the other fields I collaborate with. Um, and uh, I was at a conference once, a public policy conference, it was not a psychology conference, and I was talking to a colleague who was an engineer, and he said, 
you, that was something strange about the people at this conference? I said, yeah, I did. And he said, yeah, why are there so many women here? I said, I want to know where are all the women? So, you know, I'm used to just, you know, at least half the, the room being women. At this conference, there were maybe 20% women into this engineer. That was quite surprising. Now, we don't do as well on racial diversity. Uh, and uh, we also don't do particularly well on what's now called viewpoint diversity. Most of us are left of center. And uh, working in the public policy area, I've come to find that the, the lack of viewpoint diversity comes with a cost, a reputational cost. Psychologists are seen as liberal, and that often conveys to people the idea that that's how we interpret our findings. Um, and I've actually done some research on this with Susanna Pallets, looking uh, random digit dial study of ordinary citizens, um, looking at the inferences that citizens draw about the politics of researchers just based on the topics they study and other characteristics of, of the researcher. And what we find is uh, people are quite ready to dismiss findings just on the basis that the researcher is probably a liberal who, who was trying to find a particular finding. Now, of course, I have to talk about the replication crisis when we talk about different disciplines. And this is a sensitive subject, a, a sore spot for a lot of psychologists. Um, a lot of people feel the replicability crisis has been a black eye um, for psychology. And I have to say, I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way at all. I would say this crisis is one of the things I'm most proud of, of psychology. And I feel that way because, in fact, I've been, I've been worrying about these issues for a long time. So in 1998, I had an essay, an annual review of psychology on bias in the interpretation and use of research results, where I raised a lot of concerns about publication biases and, and ways in which we could skew our, our findings. So I've been concerned about this for, for a long time. And what I see happening right now is really exciting. I see in, in a single generation, we are really tooling up to be a, a much more rigorous science. And more off, moreover, this is being taken up by other disciplines because they begin to realize they have similar problems. And we're leading the way in, in taking steps to have more replicable research. Um, I, my small part in, in, that, in this recent conversation has been um, some papers I've published with the physicist Saul Perlmutter um, talking about uh, methods they use to avoid bias uh, that might be adapted for the social sciences. Um, when I told Saul about our replicability crisis, he said, do you perturb your data? I said, I beg your pardon? And it sounded kind of kinky to me, I don't know. Um, I, he said, well, you know, before we analyze our data, we had, we had random deviates and sometimes bias offsets so that we don't actually know whether we're supporting our hypothesis or not while we do the data analysis. Um, and then we lift the blind when it's all over. Uh, and in his lab, this, it may be weeks or even months before they lift the blind. And then they take a vote. And when they decide to lift the blind, they find out <laughs> what their study actually showed. And they've got a refrigerator in the lab with bottles of champagne and if they get the result they were hoping for, they break out the champagne. And if they don't get the result, they break out the champagne. <laughs> um, now, causal identification uh, issues, I think, also dis differ across disciplines. And really, causal identification is usually a big source of pride for psychologists, and deservedly so. Because we conduct more experiments a larger share of our published studies are experiments than the other social sciences. And this is something to be proud about. I have come to realize it does come with some steep cost. One, which we all know and give lip service to, but when you work in public policy, you really have to take seriously, is uh, the neglect of external validity. Context really matters. And the kind of contextual variables that are just swept up in our error terms in psychology are the very bread and butter of some of these other disciplines. And they will argue strenuously that we need to be looking at context. 
I've also found that we have fairly limited statistical training compared to some of our colleagues in the other disciplines. And the reason is ANOVA. One of, one of the beautiful things about random assignment is data analysis becomes a lot simpler when you don't have a lot of things to control for and concerns about how to go about controlling for things. Um, I've also found differences in numeracy across the disciplines. And what do I mean by that? Well, you might think, well, what do you mean numeracy? Psychologists are extremely quantitative. Most of our research is quantitative. But quantitative and numerate are not the same thing. By numerate here, what I have in mind is, I find that my colleagues in other disciplines, they know a lot of numbers. I mean, specific numbers. Numbers of things in the world. And they can call on these numbers and put them to use. They can do um, BOTEC, back of the envelope calculations in a flash because they've got these numbers and with a little bit of algebra, they can come up with rough estimations of things. In physics, they call this Fermi estimation. It's harder for us to do that because while we report a lot on numbers, I'm hard pressed to remember any particular numbers that uh, actually appeared in any of my tables uh, over the course of my career. I can tell you about patterns of association, but I, I, I don't remember the specific numbers. And that's partly because other disciplines get to work with natural metrics, countable objects that are out in the world. Of course, we get to do that some of the time, but a lot of times we, result, we, we rely on um, the use of psychometrics to measure things that are more subjective. Um, and the, you know, the problem with our psychometrics is, as powerful as it is, the actual numbers themselves have less meaning than when you're dealing with natural metrics. And that just comes with the territory to some extent. But I think a lot of studies would, in psychology would really benefit from including some dependent variables that are actually observable, countable, um, like actual discrete behavior, behavioral choices and so on. <sighs> Something that's very striking um, when you collaborate with physicists or economists is, where's the calculus? Um, calculus is really important in some other fields. We don't do much of that. Um, and um, I don't know what's cause and what's effect here, but I think uh, uh, a corollary of not using calculus is that we uh, tend to neglect functional forms. So uh, we rarely use dichotomous dependent variables. Most psychologists uh, are taught to make sure they have continuous at least ordinal, maybe interval, maybe even ratio level, um, dependent variables. But then a lot of times we just dichotomize our independent variables, which means we only get to look at two levels. Uh, and we rarely track things over time. Now I say this knowing that a lot of you track things over time all the time. Uh, so again, it's a generalization, but it's, it's certainly in my area of social psychology, it's true. Um, and you know, a problem with this is a, 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 a lot of things in life are not straight lines. A lot of things, have bends and in the function, functional form. And those bends can be really important. Um, and calculus is really good for trying to figure out what's the local rate of change and the idea of what's change, not the average change, but change at the margin. Um, and this is important for effect sizes because a relationship between two variables can be quite small uh, at some levels of, of the independent variable and quite profound at other levels of the independent variable where you have inflection points. Um, of course, there are exceptions. I've got here some of, some of the classics, um, Kahneman, Tversky's prospect theory, uh, Yerkes Dodson law. Um, but these are exceptions. I don't see these kinds of plot, parametric plots routinely in articles in psychology. You also don't hear psychologists talk a lot about equilibria. Um, uh, we rarely make equilibrium predictions, or actually use the word equilibrium. Um, we rarely watch things for a long time to see whether our results change over time. And this is uh, a problem because, in fact, some of our effects will actually get smaller in equilibrium. And this is something you see a lot in the program evaluation literature where the very first demonstration of an intervention will sometimes have a larger effect size. And there are a bunch of different reasons for that, but it, it's important to, to look and check and see if that's happening. At the same time, it's important to bear in mind that some effects may actually get larger in equilibrium. 
And here, just I've got a, I, I hope you can see this, but um, you know, one of the things I do that I'll talk more about in a few minutes is um, some simulation modeling. And one of the things you can see in the simulation models, even with very simple models, is the results of a simulation after just a few iterations can look quite different than the results if you let the model run longer. And here you see um, patterns of conformity after one iteration versus after 49 iterations. And if you just stopped after one iteration and published your results, you would really miss the power of conformity in this simulation. Okay, so what kind of lessons um, do I take from this? What kind of lessons might you want to take from this? So, a lot of psychologists want to contribute to policy, and a lot of people in this room do contribute to public policy. My, in my own view, there's some things that we're just inherently bad at in contributing to public policy. Uh, the number one thing that we're bad at turns out to be the number one thing policymakers want from me. They want forecasts of actual individuals' behavior or unique events. What is going to happen to this person? Um, uh, and my colleagues who work um, on national security issues are sometimes asked, you know, what is Putin going to do when we do this? Um, and they bring in a psychologist because, well, that must, must, must be a psychological question. Let's ask a psychologist. Um, and some psychologists are willing to bluff and, and offer an opinion, but that's really not our strong suit. Um, there are other things we're really good at. I think the single most important contribution I've made to public policy debates is actually a negative contribution, which is to try to tear down assumptions that people have in, in these politicized debates, to try to challenge some of the naive assumptions people make about human behavior and try to explain to them why those assumptions might not be true. And that's really important, um, and it's something I think we need to do a lot more often. I also think we're just, we're good at designing experiments. That's what a lot of us do for a living. And increasingly, I find that there's an appetite out there in the world to actually resort to experiments. Um, this is, I mean, we're seeing this now in economics. Economics has come up with a whole host of alternatives to random assignment that we're supposed to solve the problem of causal identification. Um, instrumental variables and, and so on. Um, and they've become um, jaundiced by learning that those don't always work. And so there's a lot of interest in designing experiments. We're also good at measuring meaning. I think psychology's been uh, maybe uh, re more resistant to postmodernist thinking than some of the other disciplines. And I think it's partly because um, we take seriously that there's a social construction of reality but we just assume that you can do that, you can measure that, um, and um, that we have ways of measuring it, then you can tackle that. Uh, and there's things, of course, we can do better to contribute to pu public policy. I've already talked about one, which is improving replicability. Um, but uh, although right now I'm talking about public policy, now I really want to talk about theory, because I've really come to learn that theory is really crucial to making an impact on public policy. Really, all policy decisions are, made, are based on theories. Um, they may not be the theories of a social scientist, but they're somebody's theory, and that's part, part of what, where the challenging assumptions comes in. But we can offer better theories. I know a lot of you are probably thinking of uh, the famous quote from Kurt Lewin, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. I've come to really appreciate just how true this is. Um, a lot of times people talk about generalization as if when we're generalizing to a public policy area, we're generalizing from the data to the policy environment. I don't think that's right. I think we generalize from the theory. We use the data to assess whether it's a good theory, but in the end, Inevitably, the decision that um, those findings even apply to a particular policy issue really comes from theory. So theory is really important. So how are we doing in terms of theory? This has been a source of real frustration for me in trying to contribute.
to public policy problems. So Walter Michel, when he, was, uh, when he became president of APS, has this wonderful quote about what he calls the toothbrush problem. Psychologists treat other people's theories like toothbrushes. No self-respecting person wants to use anyone else's. And this just rings true to me. I see this all the time. I see this with the proliferation of new jargon. There's nothing wrong with jargon. Every discipline has jargon. But sometimes people introduce new names for variables that sound suspiciously like other variables we already know about. Now, maybe they really are different variables. And we actually have, thanks to Campbell and Fisk, we have some ways of trying to figure out whether, in fact, they're measuring the same thing or not. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But it makes it very hard for results to accumulate across research studies, across researchers, and across sub-areas of psychology. So take a problem like uh, extremist hate groups. Any card-carrying psychologist will say that understanding hate groups is, in, in very large part, a question of psychology, and that psychology ought to be contributing to our understanding of hate groups. But if you take um, five different psychologists, each one of them will identify a different theory or variable or perspective on the problem. They may look at it in terms of norm formation. Uh, uh, a stereotyping researcher might look at it in terms of the outgroup homogeneity effect. Personality researcher will look at the dark triad of, of personality traits. Um, dissonance reduction, mortality salience, the list goes on and on. And you could all spawn your, your own lengthy list of these. Each one of these researchers will feel like they're contributing to public policy and adding insight. And in a way, they are. But when you do serious policy analysis, not just writing about a public policy problem in the last paragraph of your article, but actually trying to influence policymakers and help them think about a problem, you've got to figure out how all these different psychological phenomena could add up. What's the net prediction of all these effects? And this is something I've struggled with throughout my career. I have no trouble identifying lots and lots of important insights psychology might have to offer, but trying to figure out what does it all mean, especially when the effects don't all cut in the same direction. A lot of times the effects cut in different directions. Um, so this, this certainly came up on, in my work on uh, gays and lesbians in the US military. You know, we have a lot of research on prejudice, discrimination in social psychology. We have social identity theory. Um, some, of the, some of the work in the social identity tradition would suggest that it's just going to be impossible for these groups to work together if there's really powerful antipathy among the heterosexuals toward the homosexuals. Um, and that certainly is an issue, but of course there are really a host of different variables that are going to influence how a straight soldier decides to behave after learning that a member of their platoon has a different sexual orientation. And a lot of those factors are actually going to cut in the opposite direction and are going to seriously constrain their ability to express their antipathy. And in fact, some of these variables will actually reduce the antipathy over time. Um, so trying to figure out these net predictions is, is a real challenge. Same thing has come up in, in my work on uh, the effect of drug laws on drug use. I can identify lots of different mechanisms by which laws might affect behavior. Um, but it's very hard to figure out the net contributions. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, this, you know, this really looks like a, a, a path diagram. Why don't you actually collect the data, build the path diagram, and look at the coefficients? And of course, we can do that. Um, in a lot of situations, and that will describe the particular data we have in hand. But I'm often called on to weigh in on things that we haven't done yet. We don't get to see the coefficients until it's too late, until we've already changed the policy, when a state legalizes marijuana, or when the military changes their policy toward gays and lesbians. Um, now, for me, personally, I've really come to see 
the importance of trying to build more core theory in psychology. And I believe that core theory needs to be more formal. By formal, I mean mathematical. And a lot of people are probably groaning as I say this. It's not what they signed up for. Um, and really, I never would have imagined I would be making such arguments when I started my career. Uh, uh, you know, I barely got through algebra, much less calculus. Um, but I've come to appreciate, by collaborating with other people, the, the real power of having core theory. I don't think everything in psychology needs to be formalized, and I don't think everything needs to be a core theory. But I think a lot of people think, oh, we, don't, we can't do mathematics in psychology and a lot of areas of psychology because it's just that's unrealistic because of the enormous complexity of humanity. Now, not everybody's persuaded by this. Um, and, uh, and there's a very spirited article in uh, sociological theory uh, debunking this idea and saying, no, actually, our theories should be less nuanced than the behavior we're describing. Um, and I have some sympathy for this. Um, but mostly, I think we need to do more modeling than we're currently doing. Um, more people need to become modelers, collaborate with modelers, um, build lots of models. Um, you know, being, uh, I, I, I hesitate in saying this because one of my professors is in the room, but I never was given a problem set in any of my classes where I had to actually build a model and run it and derive predictions from it. Um, uh, I, learned, I learned computer coding, but that was just to analyze data, not to model phenomena. Um, I think people need to play with models, even if they're not publishing them, just to better understand the phenomena they're dealing with. I think people need to play with other people's models. Um, when you learn about someone else's model, actually write up some code, run some simulations, and see how does that model actually behave. Um, and I believe that understanding the behavior of models is actually a powerful way of helping us learn what kind of things to look for when we observe people. Um, ideally, these models can be merged into core theory. But a lot of people say that's just not realistic, either um, because the phenomena are too distinct from each other or because we don't have consensus yet about which is the right model. And for a lot of people, that's decisive. Until we know what the right model is, we're stuck. And I've come to learn that's not really true at all. In fact, one of the things you can do with modeling is run a bunch of different models that don't agree with each other and look for the ensemble results and try to see, is there consensus among the models? And a lot of times, very different models will agree on their predictions over a wide range of, of uh, the support of the dependent variable and over a wide range of parameter space. There will be differences, but the differences are often regions of parameter space that aren't actually very relevant for the policy question. And so even if we don't know what's the right theory, a lot of times we're pretty close to being able to make some, some general predictions because different theories lead to the same prediction. Okay, so I want to end by coming back to George Miller's uh, presidential speech. Psychology is a means of promoting human welfare. I'm literally getting goosebumps as I look at this quote because this, this paper really had a big impression on me when I was a student and continues to have a big impression on me. Our obligations as citizens are considerably broader than our obligations as scientists. If we have something of practical value to contribute, we should make every effort to ensure it is implemented. Now here's the famous part. I can imagine nothing we could do that would be more relevant to human welfare, and nothing that could pose a greater challenge to the next generation of psychologists than to discover how best to give psychology away. So uh, I see that's what I've been doing a lot in my career, is trying to give psychology away to people who don't know a lot about psychology. And um, increasingly, I'm seeing my colleagues in departments that have had a tradition of doing mostly basic research turning their attention to the outside world. So something I'm very excited about at Stanford, uh, my, my colleagues at Stanford, Jennifer Eberhardt and Hazel Marcus, have created um, what they call SPARC, Social Psychological Answers to Real Questions. Um, and uh, so students getting a PhD in social psychology at Stanford have an opportunity to get involved 
in public policy questions in an important way. Give psychology away. But I do want to talk about another interpretation of the phrase give psychology away, one that I don't think Miller had in mind. It's an article entitled Economic Imperialism. Edward Lazier says, economics is not only a social science, it is a genuine science. I'm not going to read the whole quote to you, but I'm going to go down to the last line. These ingredients have allowed economics to invade intellectual territory that was previously deemed to be outside the discipline's realm. I don't know about you, but I find that a little creepy, right? But I will say, having worked with a lot of economists, a lot of economists think that way. A lot of economists think that they've um, pretty successfully cannibalized a lot of sociology and, uh, and uh, a lot of political science. And now they're hard at work on psychology. So uh, in uh, 2002, I was on a, uh, a panel at APS. Um, it was John Darley's uh, presidential symposium on psychology and public policy uh, with uh, Danny Kahneman, uh, the economist Matt Rabin, um, and somehow I got on the panel. And um, at the time, I made this reference to the Borg from Star Trek and raised this concern about uh, behavioral economics. Um, but it was a little speculative at that time. And here I just want to show you from the, the data that, in fact, the expansion of behavioral economics has been considerable. So uh, there was a time in which it kind of looked like we had the intellectual upper hand over economics because uh, of our challenges to the rational choice theory. But what they've done is they finally stopped fighting and said, OK, you're right, but we're going to call it economics. Um, something very similar is now happening with computer science. So universities are really hiring a lot more computer scientists because of student demands. And these young computer scientists are looking for research topics, and they're rediscovering a lot of our topics. And they bring a lot of really cool tools to study those. So I see some risk for this with, for psychology. What if economics and computer science take over our phenomenon? What if they do it, and they do it really badly, but the world doesn't notice, and the world just takes what they have to offer? Maybe even worse, what if they do it really well? And they might end up doing it really well. We've always been bluffing and saying, you know, you can't model all this stuff formally. Human, human behavior is too complex. They, they don't have that view, and they're plunging in and building models. And we're going to find out, you know, who's right. Now, my own view is, first of all, they pain me to say it, but we don't own our phenomenon. Human behavior, the human mind, the, these are topics that, that any discipline can study, and every discipline has some claim to. Um, I also recognize, when I put aside my in-group biases, progress is good, however it comes about. And I also recognize the competition across fields is really healthy. But in my view, collaboration is really healthy, and it's a lot more fun. Thank you.